Hello, everyone. Welcome to Redeem Life Church. I'm Pastor Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Get ready to hear a powerful message from our pastors. So grab your coffee, grab a loved one or a friend, and grab something to take notes. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Well, good afternoon, church, and welcome to Redeemed Life. My name is Pastor Bonnie, and along with my husband, we get the honor of leading here in Azusa, California. And I'm excited about preaching today and continuing our sermon series, The Summer Jams Mixtape. But before we get in the word, let me begin with prayer. Father God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the word, Lord. I ask that you be with us and that you speak to us and through us, Father. I ask that you give us just the wisdom, what it is that you want us to hear in this message, and that it fall in ears that are ready to listen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon. I am excited to be here with you guys today and really going into the summer jams, the mixtape. And we've learned a lot about each other in the last couple of weeks through this series. We've learned about each other's music preferences. We've also learned that, you know, some of us started with eight tracks, with records, with cassette tapes, with CDs, with M3, M MP3s, with streaming. But l we all have that sound soundtrack in our lives. We have that music in our lives. And we've learned about these different jams. And you remember when you'd walk in into the club and be like, this is my jam. I mean, when you walked into church and you said, this is my jam, you know, I just want to make sure I keep it, I keep it holy. <laughs> we've also learned about the other jams. We learned about grape jelly jam. We learned about door jams, paper jams, frequency jams, radar jams, steel door jams, and we even learned what the actual word jams actually stands for. And it stands for just add more scripture. Isn't that just brilliant? Pastor Anthony brought to that to us last week. Just add more scripture. Listen, I believe that life itself has a soundtrack and a theme song in our lives. And we get to choose it depending on the season of our life and what we're going through. And it changes because it changes as we change over the years. But you know, you can listen to a song from back in the day and it takes you right back to that moment, to that season. It can probably remind you of your parents. It can remind you of your childhood, your teenage years, your salvation, that song, you know, the one that they sing in church, you come in and you're trying to be all poised and you just start bawling like that ugly cry because you're like, yes, Jesus. That's a jam, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> There's music too that'll take you to college, to your first job, to maybe finishing a marathon, to a success in your life, your marriage, your first dance, your kids. Like life is riddled with those jams in our life. And somehow, there's always that one particular song that will always take you back. You'll remember exactly how you felt, what things tasted like, what you smelled, the surroundings, the environment. It just takes you back to that moment in time as if it were frozen. I remember there was a season in my life that was full of Lionel Richie. I want to say, go with me. I'm going to lose half the church right now that's like younger I'm just going to say younger, I'm not going to say my age, younger than me, <laughs> but I'm going to take you into the 80s, and I was born and raised in East Los Angeles in El Barrio, you know, got to represent, and I just remember those hot summer days. My parents worked, and they would be what today we're calling essential workers, so they worked a lot, and Saturdays was a very important day, we would just laze around the house sit at the porch, people sitting at their porches, drinking their Jamaica or hibiscus water, as we like to call it nowadays, watching kids play, the sprinklers in someone's yard and kids running in and out, kids riding their bike. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. Someone working on their car, someone working on their yard, everyone's just out, the ice cream trucks rolling on by. So we lived in this little house. We were actually in a back house to a bigger house. But my parents had this driveway, and they would sit on the porch, and they would just sit there and watch me ride my little bike. And, and there was in the driveway one of my parents' prized possessions, one of the first things that I remember them owning. 
that was like a big deal to them that they had saved up. And it was a 1964 Ford Falcon convertible. This was my parents' Pred and Joe. And there's a picture of me and my dad. And there's the Ford Falcon. Look at me in my little half top when it was appropriate. <laughs> the only time it's appropriate, by the way. <laughs> With my little red purse on top of that falcon. And, and I just remember that falcon was white. And it used to have like these fire stickers or painted on, I don't know what it was, on the side. So when you would be driving by, it'd be like the fire was just going by. And I remember my dad was going to reupholster it, and I, I think inside it had been a different color, and, and he took me with him, and he wanted it red, but there was all these reds, and I remember him showing me, like, all these little, like, leather swatches that I could help him pick, and he was like, which red do you like? And I could, you know, only read so many words, and so I just remember popping out. It said, candy apple red. And I was like, Dad, I want the candy apple red leather inside the car. And so that's the red that you see in there. And I just remember those afternoons in those cars. So the first soundtrack that I can really actually remember in my life, the first summer jam I could really remember was that with my parents, Lionel Richie in the background, neighborhood kids playing. We'd go out for a drive. I'd sit in the back seat before seatbelts were a known thing of importance. And it was like this huge seat that I basically would slide from back and forth. And I was in, I grew up an only child. I actually have three siblings, but that's a whole other soap opera story I'll say for another time. <laughs> so I'd sit there by myself and I just remember driving and everyone was trying to drive a convertible. Like it was a thing in this era because you got to remember this is a time when it was Prince and the little red Corvette came out, Stevie Wonder, Kenny Rogers, Michael Jackson, Shalimar, Journey. Um, it was Boy George and the Culture Club. That was the era that I'm trying to paint for you. This song takes me back every time. Feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose. Cause I'm on my way mm -mm. Needed a friend And the way I feel now I guess I'll be with you till the end Guess I'm on my way Mighty glad you stayed and I'm mighty glad you stayed through that song because what I don't have in my gifting in my voice, I have in passion and pastor will definitely tell you for that. <laughs> but listen, that song takes me back to those car rides. And it takes me back to my dad sitting on the porch in those lazy Saturdays. And, and I remember back that day, that, the, that car seemed massive to me. And those cars, listen, they were made out of steel. They're solid. Like, those can hit my today minivan that I think is like this big monster. Crush it in a second. Because these cars are no joke. And I just remember we would drive and then we'd come home and... Inevitably, I'd always leave a teddy bear or something in the back seat that when I was riding around my bike, I want it. And my parents would be sitting on the porch and my dad would be like, well, open the door and you can get it. See, I had a big Italian Sicilian father who was like, you could do anything you want to do and very encouraging and very like, come on, you can conquer it. So I just remember having to go to this door. And it's this huge steel door and you have to like, they're not easy like today, like now you can just like tap your foot and the door opens. No, like you have to like, push a button really hard and like grab the handle and pull it back. And I'm like this like scrawny little tomboy with a bull haircut, like just not that strong. But I was determined to get what I wanted to the car and really to make my parents proud who were sitting in there going, you can do it, you can do it. So I remember putting my entire strength, opening the door, pulling it, it would shoot me over because it's so heavy. And I just jump in the car, be so excited, grab my toy, come out, put it on the floor. And then I had to close the door. That was a whole other thing because the door was heavy, so I had to like pull the door, close it. But I never quite got the concept at that age that like I would put my hand in the door, kind of like in the jam, and then I would put the, my other hand in the handle, then I'd slam the door, and every time I would slam my fingers. Every time. Maybe it was just so dramatic, but I really believe it was like a hundred million times that it happened to me. And my dad would be like, you can do it. You can, no, just open it and pull your hand out. And I just remember being like, why are you being so mean? Help me with this thing. And it was just so 
frustrating to me in those moments in my life. But I just remember that, like, I needed to use my entire body strength to open the door. But closing the door, it really took something else out of me. And I would scream for my parents to come and see. One thing that my dad taught me was that closing it required a whole other skill that he wanted me to learn. It was a process that had a purpose. I didn't understand it then. And as a little girl, I just thought my dad honestly was like, come on, toughen up. Like that's the kind of environment I grew up in, the kind of family that I had. And I didn't understand why he wouldn't come help me. But my dad knew that if I didn't learn to close doors properly in my life, I would actually be stuck with my hand in the past, trapped in the past, in the present, and never going to my future. And see, when you go through the process, it's in order so you'll be able to stand up and stand strong as your purpose is coming and you're being prepared. Because process has a purpose. And purpose has a process. Process has a purpose. And purpose has a process. And I wonder how many of us today in different parts in our lives, we're not feeling stuck, stuck to a door, stuck to a past, stuck to a present, simply because we haven't learned how to close doors in our life properly. See, unable to close a door behind us, leaving us frozen, attached, keeping us from our future and our purpose and what God has in store for us. And I think if we're honest, all of us have had that experience at one point in our lives, in something in our lives. See, and the Israelites understood this. But see, God also sent two people that would witness during the process and guide them to a purpose. And witness is what we need right now in this generation, church. I believe that the church today is being called to be a witness, especially right now during this pandemic. Right now when people are looking at this COVID season and they're trying to find purpose and they're flailing and they're trying to grasp onto something. Not only do I think we can have a witness, I think it's something that the Lord is putting on us right now, is for us to share with others the process that has brought us to our purpose, or the process that we are still on because we understand that there's a purpose and we understand that there's a promised land. Okay. See, today we're going to be looking at Joshua. Joshua and Caleb, some of my favorites. And we're going to be looking at chapter one, but I'm going to give you a little backstory because you guys know I like a little backstory. I like to know why are we studying this? Where did they come from? Who are these people? I like all that. I want to bring people up to speed. So here we are. There's the nation of Israel who's been enslaved for 430 years and God sends Moses to lead them out of Egypt and out of slavery. So they're finally on their way and they've seen the vision of the promised land and it looks good. It's the land that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were promised. It's the land covenant. They're going after it. They know it. And the Israelites are witnessing all these miracles firsthand. Not just like we get to read about them. They were living these miracles firsthand. They were witnessing the 10 plagues that hit Pharaoh in order for them to go free. They were witnessing the Red Sea parting. They're witnessing water and food and meat given to them in the desert desert. They see the Ten Commandments be given to Moses. And a little side note, did you know that the book of Exodus, where all this history is recorded, where all this is being told to us, is the book in the Old Testament that has the most recorded miracles. Isn't it interesting that in the desert years of these people who have walked out of slavery, they're not completely arrived yet. And it's the hardest time in these people's lives and they're really having to go for their faith. That is where God is showering them with miracle upon miracle upon miracle to keep them going. Say there's a process, but there's a purpose. There's a process, but there's a purpose. Keep going because you're going there. 
But along the way, they start getting tired of the process. They don't understand, and they start falling back to their old sins and their old ways. And for 40 years, after 430 years, for 40 years, Israel has to walk through the desert because of their own flailing faith. The refusal to trust God fully for every step of the process. See, Moses knew that the time was coming and then they had to take the land of Canaan. He was ready. And so listen, one time he got these 12 spies and said, okay, I need these 12 spies to go over and look at this land and come back and give us a report so we can get ready to take this land. Well, 10 of those spies came back and said, nah, man, there are some giants there. We're not ready for this. We don't have a big enough army. We can't take this. But there were two witnesses, church, two witnesses, Joshua and Caleb, that came back. And what they saw, they were about to witness. They said, no, this is the land of milk and honey, and we can take it. We see the vision. We see the land. We can do this. Everybody needs a Joshua and a Caleb in their life at some point in their life. When the world is trying to tell you, we can't do this. We can't socially separate a church. You can't keep us from here. You can't keep us from singing. Our kids can't go to school. But then there's got to be a voice of reason. Like there's a purpose in this process. And we got to keep on walking right now. I remember there was a point in my life where I had a Joshua Ben and Caleb moment. I have triplets with pastor who are now 14 years old. But at this time, they're about one and a half. And so those were some hard years. Those were some desert years, church. Some real desert years. I'm a witness. It was, they, they are amazing, but it was hard. It was hard. And I remember at this point, pastor, between he and I, we had three jobs. And he was going to seminary. And I was having these one and a half year old little triplets, okay? And he comes to me, he's so inspired going to seminary and just really going for it. And he's like, you need to really sign up to go to seminary. I really feel like you would just love it and you would thrive. And I'm looking at this fool like, I got these kids running around trying to climb me all the time. I got this job. We have a dog. Like there was so much going on. And I just remember everything seemed like a giant to me. But he just, he was so fervent in what he was saying and what he saw. And he's like, no, we got to do it. We'll make a way. We'll find a way. I'll go part-time so you can go part-time. And I was just so appreciative that he was that Joshua and that Caleb in our lives in that moment. Because I do believe that that was a word that he saw. And he saw a vision. And he walked us through a process for a purpose. I think we all need those people in our lives. See, the Israelites, they couldn't seem to close the door properly, kind of like me when I was little, on the old thoughts, the old ways. So they were unable to walk into the promised land. And eventually Moses, too, comes to the end of his life. But he appoints Joshua to lead them to the next era. See, Joshua was about to lead the Israelites, but he also had Caleb. There were two of them. So when we begin in the book of Joshua, we have the Israelites camped around the east bank of the Jordan River. And they're at the very edge, y'all, at the very edge of the promised land. And they can see it. And so you have to remember, Joshua was Moses' He was a shadow, his apprentice. He was with him all the time. He was there when they exited Egypt. He was a general in the army that actually strategically helped get them into places. See, he was able to walk halfway up the mountain with Moses when he received the law. And he was a witness to the next generation. So I think sometimes it's easy for us to look at the Israelites and say, that was the old generation. I'm not of the old generation. I'm of this new generation. And this new generation is going to take the land and we're going to see it and we see the purpose. But you also have to remember there's also a gap and there's a bridge. And the bridge would be Joshua and Caleb. 
It's a witness, church. A witness that brings two generations together, teaches the new generation that, hey, there was a process to get to this purpose. Just because you get shown the purpose doesn't mean you're going to get it the next. There's a process for you to be able to withstand that which God is about to show in your life. And so with this new generation going to Israel, the old generation in the past, and this new generation, they knew something. Because the old generation, though they flailed a little in their trust, they believed in the Lord. And so they taught this new generation the love of God. They taught this generation how to honor him. And so this new generation was prepared. It's a new crew, and they see the land. But see, they were born during the process. They were born during the turmoil of the old generation. See, the old generation was birthing, birthing the new generation. And see, these two leaders, Joshua and Caleb, were there to witness. And so when we get to Joshua 1... It starts by telling us that Moses has gone to be with the Lord, and the Lord comes to speak to Joshua. And he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give to them and to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your foot sets as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the great river of the Euphrates, to the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea, to the west. Verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. He says it again. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua, this was given to him. And he came and he gave it to the new generation. And he was going to guide them. And he had three points to remind them of where they were going. Point number one, obey God's law. Point number two, be strong and and courageous because it's not enough to just know God's law. You also have to be strong enough to learn in the process and to gain that to follow through. But then don't get it twisted. Number three, you constantly have to read the book of the law. You constantly have to be reading the Bible to yourself and reminding yourself of the promises that God has for you and your generations to come. See, Joshua had lived through it all. And he wanted to witness and encourage this new generation about what he learned in the process. And every generation needs a witness, church, to remind us of the past and guide us with wisdom towards the future and the purpose. Because God shows us the purpose. He showed us each our purpose in life, but he doesn't show us the process. He doesn't show us every little step, everything you're going to have to break down in your life, every person that you're going to have to cut out of your life because they're not walking with the Lord, everything that you have to do to get to your process. But he shows you the purpose. And that's what Joshua was trying to put into this new generation. See, Joshua was there, and he's with the people, and they're about to take this new land. So he's ordering the people to get ready, to get the camp ready. Tell the people, get all your provisions ready, because in three days, we're going to take the Jordan, and here we're going to take all the possessions of the land, because the Lord your God is giving it to us. 
But the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said to Joshua, Remember that Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, gave, um, you after he, gave to you after he said, he said, the Lord your God will give you this land. So they're basically saying, well, we're kind of already in our land. Like we said, can we stay on this side? This is our land. So like we're good, right? We're going to go here. You guys are going to go over there. But see, Joshua was like, no, 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 no. Because that's like saying, you know, we're Christian. We're here at church. We're good, right? We can just watch together. We could do the food pantry. We can give. We're good. That's not good enough. Because you have to be there to witness to others. You have to be there for each other. We have to be there to show the gospel with our hands and our feet and our lives. So he says to them, you and your wives and your children and your lost livestock will have this land, the one that Moses told you you were going to have, but not until you help the rest of us conquer the rest of the land. And this is what I love about this new generation. Joshua worked so hard to witness to them and to share with them and to encourage them and to show them what they were walking. And they were listening and they were grasping it. They were learning from the wisdom and the process that had come before them. And so this is what their answer is when he says, no, you still have to help. This will be your land. They said, whatever you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. They repeated the words to him. The generation was getting the process, and they were ready to take the purpose and the promised land. Remember, I shared with you about the car. That's my car right now in my garage. Yeah, tires are flat. The brakes, well, let's just say there are no brakes. <laughs> and it's been sitting like that in my garage for 20-something years. Because when I graduated college, my parents decided that they were going to give me this car as like a family heirloom. Like, here is this car. Well, I was just graduating college. I'm like, living in an apartment. What am I going to do with it? So we put it in the garage. A couple years later, I work on it a little bit. But I really just left it there for many years. See, I shared with you, honestly, a little snippet of my life. What this car represented, a picture, a moment. But see, this car also represented a lot of things in my life. It also represented a fractured relationship with my earthly father. A lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of confusion, abuse. But it also, on this other side, represents a lot of healing, a lot of restored relationships with my earthly father. And if I'm honest, even with my heavenly father, as I wrestled through my life and trying to get some of these things back on track because I got stuck in the process somewhere. And I remember being excited when they gave me the car, but kind of being annoyed at the same time because of everything that this car represented. But see, one day I had to realize that my hand was no longer stuck in the door of this car. And there had come a season in my life where this actually, redeeming this car, seemed like something joyful. And so for the last six months or so, we've been preparing with my kids and my husband to restore this car. With the thanks to some amazing people in our church who just do this kind of stuff and have passion and, and have kind of ignited that in me again. A season in my life where things are being redeemed. See, because for too many years, I just let it sit stagnant in a garage. But what I'm excited about in restoring this car, it's not so much the car. It's just the thing. What I'm excited about is that the car represents so much more. The car represents a life being restored. 
very much like here, redeemed life. We call it that for a reason. Because we always believe that God can take whatever broken piece you think you have and restore it back to the beauty that he intended it for. And so I have this vision in my head of one day driving down Azusa Avenue. And this is what I'm going to look like. I'm going to just show you real quick. This is in my head. Driving down Azusa, you know I'm going to look cute in my car, my candy apple red, driving. I might even put the fire back on it because, you know, come on, the word of the Lord is fire. So I want people seeing. <laughs> and you know what? It may seem silly. And Pap likes to call me bougie sometimes. But listen, bougie, let me tell you what the meaning of bougie is. Bougie is marked by concern for wealth, possessions, and respectability. Okay, respectability, yes. But, you know, I like nice things, but they're just things. Half the time I give them away anyways. But then there's a definition of barrio, which is where I'm from, which is a Spanish-speaking part of a quarter of the neighborhood of the town you're in. So I have decided that I like a new word for myself, and I'm going to call myself bujario, and combine both of the words. I'm going to tell you why. Because I believe that when I'm driving down Azusa Avenue, I want people from my church to be like, oh, hey, there's my pastor. And I just shared a little bit of part of my story. And so you'll be like, oh, there's a great story attached to that car. There's a great witness attached to that car. Because that car isn't helping her get stuck with her hand in the past, but she's actually using it to walk and to witness about the future. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, we come up here, and as pastors, we share wholeheartedly, and it, it seems like it's something that's easy to do, but to come up here and say, yes, these are my scars. These are my mistakes. These are my sins. These were my addictions, but you know what? This is my redemption, and this is my healing, and this is my life now. So when another little Latina girl who's living in the barrio can see me driving the car could say hey you know what she did it so can I because it's about witnessing in every season of our lives it's not about being about the past generation or the future generation because we could get pompous about being of this new generation but can you be the bridge that shows people the process to get to the purpose so this car represents so much more this image in my head is so much more. It's the miracles that we see. It's the miracles in the process. The miracles that are accounted when they were in the desert. The miracles that are given to us when we are thirsty and hungry. And at the end of what we think is in us, that God says, no, keep going in the process because there's a purpose to where I'm taking you. And Lionel Richie represents a season in my life. And there's another part of that song, too. And I think maybe, maybe it could represent something in your life. And in this lyrics, it shows us. And I know just where I'm going. I'm going to heaven, y'all. I'm gonna pack up all my troubles and I'm gonna throw them all away. But guess where? At the foot of the cross. You know why? Because this time, I'm coming home. I'm coming home to church because I'm coming home to stay because I'm stuck on you, Lord. See how God can redeem every single thing in our life and he can bring us back to that soundtrack take us back to what it meant but give us new meaning i love that that song at the end says mighty glad you stayed aren't you mighty glad you stayed god's never left it's us that walked away friend i pray that today no matter what's going on in your life. You can hear that soundtrack, that summer jam that plays in your life and know that God's calling you to him. That he's saying it's not enough to just play Christian. It's not enough anymore to just say that that's what you are. It's time 
to really give your heart and to take your hand out of that, jam in that door, and keep walking to your purpose. Because this is just part of the process, but we're all walking together to that promised land. And I want to give you an opportunity today. If today you feel like, I don't know if I've ever given my life to the Lord. I don't know if I've ever said, God, I really believe in you. Okay, God, I've done everything every other way. But this time, I'm going to try it this way because I have nothing else left to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to tell you to sit there quietly, close your eyes, and accept God into your heart in whatever way that means to you, however he's speaking to you right now. Or maybe you're a Christian, but you feel like that's been you. You've just been playing Christian, and you forgot that you have a witness you forgot that there was so much process that you have to share that this new generation needs. That you are the bridge that can, get, can put that together from the old generation to the new generation. And I want you to pray this with me too. And say that you're recommitting your life to God. That you're saying, God, I'm here. I don't know why I fell asleep behind that wheel, but I'm here. And I'm here to stay. So pray with me. Father God, I just ask... That right now, Lord, I repent of my past mistakes. And God, I ask for forgiveness. God, I ask for forgiveness of you and I ask that I forgive myself, God, that I let it go. God, I ask that you step into my life and fully take over and show me the purpose that I have. I accept the sacrifice that was done on Calvary. I accept the blood that Jesus dropped for me. Father God, I just come and I say, I want this new life. I want to stay. I want to walk into purpose. And I want the process to be guided by you, Father. Come and infiltrate my life. I give you my heart today. And I commit myself to you in the name of the Father. Welcome home. It's that easy. It's that easy. I want to tell you too and leave you with encouragement that at the end of Joshua's life, he also wanted to encourage the generation that was coming. And in verse 15 in chapter 25, he says to them, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands we're living now. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And that is part of the generation that you are now. So welcome home. We love you and we're glad that you're with us. And we also have next steps for you. Because we're not going to just walk you into the promised land and be like, good luck. You're walking with a whole squad with you now. And if you're watching on any of our social media channels, we have pastors online that are going to put links right now of what those next steps look like. If you are just watching online right now, you can go on our website and pull those down for yourself. But there's next steps. And you can contact me and pastor directly and we can walk those steps with you. We want you to know that you have a home. You have a family. You're welcomed here. We've missed your presence here, and we're ready to walk this process into the promised land. Thank you for letting me share. We love you guys. We hope this message encouraged you. And if it did, would you please share it or tag a friend? Also, if you would like more information, you can visit our website at redeemlife.church. And if you want to give, you can also go to our website and press the give button. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and make it a great week.